Hi, I'm Ken Ham, CEO of Answers and Genesis, the Creation Museum, and the Ark Encounter. You know, when we opened the two Christian-themed attractions that are actually attracting visitors from all over the world, the Creation Museum in 2007 and the Ark Encounter in 2016, I've had quite a number of visitors who have asked me how this all came together. I mean, to them, it seems like an impossible task to build two Christian-themed attractions that are impacting people all around the world with God's Word and the Gospel as visitors pour into those particular facilities. It seems like an impossible task. Actually, it seems like mission impossible. I think about those movies and I think about, you know, what if God had spoken to myself, my wife, when we were children and said, your mission, should you accept it, is to eventually move to America and to be a part of forming the Answers in Genesis ministry and building and opening two Christian-themed attractions, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, that will impact millions with God's Word and the Gospel. I, I think we would have run in the other direction. But you know, as I look back on that history, I see God's hand in just so many miraculous ways. Unlikely people that he brought together in unusual ways in many instances. Unique circumstances, events, what we call Red Sea moments. I mean, really, I think we could call it mission seemingly impossible. But you know, with God, nothing is impossible. That's what his word says. And so in October 2018, before a live audience, I gave a presentation of my personal testimony going back to my childhood and then how the Answers in Genesis ministry, the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter all came about. It's an amazing story and it's a fire in my bones, which is what we call the name of the DVD, the fire that started Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And throughout the presentation, I show many personal photographs and some that I don't think have been viewed by people in 50, 60 years or so. And I also talk about a number of people, but three in particular, three very special people. And you'll see that as I go through a fire in my bones. I trust you enjoy and are challenged by what God has done as he's brought together a remarkable group of people with remarkable events and circumstances to weave a beautiful pattern. I trust you enjoy this presentation. Please give a warm welcome to the CEO and founder of Answers in Genesis, Mr. Ken Ham. Oh, thank you. Answers in Genesis is an apologetics organization, the leading creation apologetics organization in the world, uh, equipping Christians to defend the Christian faith and challenging non-Christians concerning the truth of God's word and the gospel. And this year, 2018 in December, is the official 25th anniversary of the Answers in Genesis ministry. And actually, it's 43 years since I first started speaking on this topic and 39 years since I first went full-time leaving school teaching in Australia to go full-time into the creation apologetics ministry. Answers in Genesis has many different facets. I mean, we, we have a radio program, we produce a Sunday school curriculum that's used in about 10,000 churches. We have a VBS program that as in the top three sold in the world, we produce books and DVDs and 
of course, built the two attractions, the Ark Encounter, the Creation Museum. Uh, our website, answersingenesis.org, our main website, we have many other websites, had close to 30 million visits in 2017. Our daily radio program, it feels like I've been doing it for millions and millions of years, uh, but it's a daily radio program. It's only a short feature, but it's on about a thousand stations, including a number of Spanish stations. We get some incredible feedback from that. Even, even for a, a 60 second radio program, I've actually heard many testimonies over the year of people saying they were saved as a result of that because it answered a question they had and, and uh, drove them to go to the scriptures. We have tens of thousands of people that read our award-winning Answers magazine and 10,000 churches that have used our Answers Bible curriculum, which is unique in the world, apologetics, biblical authority, chronological and it connects Old and New Testament, and churches are telling us it revolutionizes their churches. Our VBS programs have an emphasis on apologetics, they're evangelistic, and we find churches telling us that they're so tired of the fluff and stuff that uh, they've used over a number of years, and they love the meat of the Answers in Genesis VBS program. In fact, the one for 2019 is on the race issue. I don't believe anyone's ever done that before for a vacation Bible school program. One family, one race, one savior. We have a large warehouse. I call it a mini Christian Amazon. Okay, compared to Amazon, it's mini, right? But it's actually significant in shipping these resources that we produce all over the world. We have a phenomenal lineup of powerful, dynamic speakers. We do a lot of domestic outreach, international outreach, and of course, uh, Answers in Genesis built the two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world, the Creation Museum and also the Ark Encounter that are impacting millions of people and all with an ultimate purpose to preach the gospel. Well, I hear people commenting on the museum, the Ark Encounter, the ministry as a whole, and then many say to me, how did all this come about? Because Actually, I must admit, every time I go to the Ark Encounter or come to the Creation Museum or walk around the ministry, I, I just look at it and say, wow, look what God has done. It's just a miracle. It really is a miracle. And so I wanted to give you a real personal testimony of what happened in my life uh, to be a part of bringing all this about. And to start off with, let's look at Proverbs 13.22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And, you know, a lot of times when we think about inheritance, we think about a material inheritance, but the most important inheritance is actually that spiritual inheritance that I call a legacy. And I would say this, that really the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, the Ministry of Answers in Genesis, that we would say conservatively speaking right now impacts 30 million people a year, at least 30 million people a year directly, is really a legacy of parents who taught their children to stand boldly and unashamedly on the authority of the Word of God and also uncompromisingly on the Word of God. So let me take you back to my homeland in Australia. My father was a teacher and he was transferred around as he was promoted and because he was really good at what he did, he was very diligent and wanted to, to maintain the highest of standards, he was promoted. Uh, in the minimum amount of time you're allowed to be promoted. And so we traveled all over the state of Queensland. We even ended up in some very remote places uh, in, in the west of Queensland as well, near the center uh, of Australia. And my parents, as, as they traveled around, a lot of those places didn't have many churches, if any churches sometimes. And they were always looking for ways in which they could bring God's word and the gospel to the place where God actually took them. Well, in 1951, a hospital in Cairns, Australia, wrote out a little name tag for a baby. And that, I found it in, in some of the things that my mother had, and there it is, the name tag for me. Notice that they actually back then put sex, male, you're actually allowed to do that back then. Uh, so <laughs> that tells you something about our current culture, doesn't it? And when I left hospital, look, I was seven pounds, two ounces. I always wanted to know that. But I was a cute baby, uh, as you can see. And my father, as I said, was a teacher. And as they were transferred around, they would start Sunday schools. If there was no Sunday school in an area, they started Sunday schools. They would bring evangelists in to be able to reach people, and particularly children, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This was taken to a little town called Scottsville. It's a coal mining town, actually. Uh, in Queensland, 
And my, you see the car there up on the ramp because my, my parents never had much in the way of material goods. Uh, they, they didn't have material things and they didn't get much money. School teachers were very poorly paid. And so to save money, dad would fix the cars and he would actually teach me how to do that. And I remember uh, setting points, doing timing, putting in a new clutch plate, pressure plate, because these days you have no idea how to fix cars. It's all electronic, got to plug it into a computer. Uh, but they were the days when they were real cars, I think. But the, the thing is, he would do that to save money so that they could look after their children and because they wanted to use whatever they had to reach people uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was their heart. And so I grew up in, in that sort of family. In fact, I, I remember my parents, you know, if they had something extra, a piece of furniture or something, uh, they didn't want to sell it. They would always look for someone to give it away to. And to this day, I, I can't sell things that we, you know, if, we, if we've uh, purchased something new or, you know, we don't need something, I, I want to give it away. Uh, it's just the influence of parents. That, that, that impact on my life is uh, tremendous. And just a reminder to all of us how much what we do and how we act impacts our children and people who are observing you as well. Well, the family started to grow. I had a sister. They're born, Rosemary, and I grew more cute, uh, as you can see. I'm the one holding the koala, uh, just to make sure I understood that. And yes, very cute. I had a pet bird, and the bird still loved me, as you can see there. And we grew to five, and eventually six children, actually. We used to go camping a lot. So we would go camping in a tent like that, or a caravan, uh, and Whenever we went camping, my father loved to go fishing. He loved catching fish. And he loved catching lots of fish. And he loved getting them ready for, you know, grilling and so on. He was a fisherman. But you know, most of all, he loved to be one of those fishers of men. And one of my favorite pictures of my father is him sitting there in his chair with his Bible on his knee, teaching people the word of God. And the thing I remember about my father, he would always get so excited. And, and, and if he was doing a Bible study in our house like he was here, whenever he came across verses where it said, thus says the Lord, you would hear him emphasize, thus says the Lord. He would emphasize it with, with authority because this is the word of God. And then when he came across these sorts of words, it is written. Oh, he loved those sorts of words. It is written. Thus says the Lord. Have you not read? because he was so emphatic about the authority of the Word of God. You know, it's interesting, when my father died, 9th of June, 1995, before he died, my brother Robert, who's with the Lord now as well, uh, sat with him and asked him a question and said, Dad, why did you love God's Word so much? And his answer was this. He said his father died when he was 16 years old, so he didn't have an earthly father, so he turned to the words of his heavenly father, and he read them over and over and over again saturated himself in the Word of God. And you know, I thought about that when, when I heard that answer. I thought how important that is for each one of us. And the Scripture tells us to do that too, to saturate ourselves in the Word of God. And the Bible verse on his gravestone there is Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that would sum up my father. Another verse of Scripture that reminds me of my father is this one, Nehemiah 5.6. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. Don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about a righteous anger, not a sinful anger. And you know, when you read through Nehemiah, he would get angry. Why isn't somebody rebuilding this wall? Why isn't somebody doing something about these injustices? We need to do something. My father was like that. If he saw something happening in the church that uh, shouldn't be happening, taught something they shouldn't be taught, we need to do something about that. I remember a number of specific instances. For instance, at one church, and you know, some of the towns we went to, there, there might have been only one or two churches. My, my parents would look for the church they thought would teach the Bible the best. That's what they would look for. And sometimes there just was no church where the pastor really stood on the authority of the Word of God like he so, should. At one place, I remember a pastor started talking about the loaves and fishes, and he said, just as a, a little boy took out his loaves and fishes as an example, then the others followed suit. <laughs> I remember my father going to the pastor afterwards with the Bible open. Thus saith the Lord, <laughs> it is written. <laughs> this was a miracle. And uh, he would uh, do that in front of us, not in an angry way, but really burdened that people hear the truth. 
Uh, another time I remember a church where the devotional booklet that was handed out to the congregation when my father was going through it, oh, there was steam coming out of his ears. Cause I, and and uh, then I heard what it was. He said, they're saying Noah's flood was a local event. It wasn't a local event, it was a global event. And uh, he was really upset about that. And he went to the pastor, and I remember this, saying to the deacons and saying, you shouldn't be handing this out. It's undermining the authority of the word. You know, it's interesting, so many times when he would do things like that, he would have people come to him, uh, people from uh, the, the church or even some of the elders or deacons of the church, and they'll say, we, we really agree with you. But they weren't prepared to stand up like he was. And I saw that he was prepared to stand up for what he believed in. Another time, I remember at church, there was a, a gay couple, even back then, that was coming to church. And to my father, that's good, they need to hear the gospel. But then the pastor was going to allow them to sing in the choir. Well, my father was so upset about that, because then you're condoning that to the congregation. You can't do that. And again, he had others come to him on the sidelines and say, yeah, we agree with you. But they weren't prepared to stand up. And you know, all this had a great uh, influence on me. And then there was a time we moved to a town called Serena, and that was uh, south of Mackay in Queensland. And there we went to a Presbyterian church, because there was mainly a Presbyterian and a Methodist church, actually. And we went to the Presbyterian church. And it's interesting, because I grew up in Australia, so I, because there were so few churches and areas we went to, I grew up Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, uh, Brethren, I mean, a bit of everything. And, uh, you know, sort of cross denominational lines so that I sort of, when we came to America, it was sort of different when you see people so adamant about their denominational boundaries in a way. And that was sort of different for me. And I just brought up in a whole different set of circumstances. But, you know, I learned that, you know, there, there are Baptists going to heaven and there are Presbyterians going to heaven and even some Methodists are going to heaven. And, even some of the brethren are going to heaven, and I, I, I learned that. But anyway, one day the pastor for this sermon taught that you can believe in evolution, and you don't need to believe in literal genesis. Oh, I thought my father was going to explode. And I mean, this is when I was about uh, 12 years old. When I grew up in the elementary schools in Australia, they used to have what they call fancy dress balls, uh, costume parties. And we'd have one every year, a costume party for the kids. And my mother was very creative. And she used to decorate wedding cakes and known for her exquisite uh, icing on wedding cakes and so on. Well, she used to make our costumes. And so this was one of the parties we went to at the school. And I was a chef. My sister Rosemary was a doll in the box. And now, the sister Beverly was a Christmas tree. And uh, my brother Robert, he's uh, with the Lord now, and uh, he was uh, obviously, I think, an Indian. And then another one, I was Robin Hood. Look at that. Uh, well, the interesting thing was, the year that this uh, pastor taught evolution, and my parents were so upset about that, guess what they did for my costume? I have never released this to the public ever before today. And knowing the ministry that I'm now in, you're going to find this really interesting. And it also tells you something about my parents, because they were so against evolution. So they dressed me up as an ape, <laughs> holding a sign on a potted plant that says, Our Family Tree. <laughs> so it was a spoof of evolution. So even back then, it was obviously, it, it was obviously very prophetic, I think. <laughs> I was obviously predestined to be in this mission. I mean, you can see that right there. I think it's an amazing photo, actually, when I look back on that. And it reminds me of my parents' stand on God's word and just to think of the ministry that I'm now in. And uh, I think God does have a sense of humor uh, in that way. Well, you know, my, my parents taught us apologetics. They didn't use the word apologetics. My father never used that word. But it really was apologetics, because one of the things he would do, he, he would get so upset at the liberals and, and the liberal theology in our churches, and he was always researching what the liberal critics were saying so that he could give us answers, because he didn't want us doubting the word of God. And so I was brought up uh, with that emphasis. 
And he taught us to build our thinking on God's word. And I, I, I remember some of the things he taught. I've never forgotten them. If something contradicts the Bible, the first thing you do is you go to the Bible, make sure you're taking it in context, according to the literature, according to the language. And if you're sure that's exactly what God is saying, because this is God's word, and let him speak to you. Don't you try to add things to the Bible. Don't you try to uh, add something to try to change it because there's some seeming contradiction. And if you're sure the Bible is teaching what you, you believe it does, you're standing on God's word, and there's still a contradiction, it means there's something wrong with what man is saying. And just because we don't have an answer doesn't mean there isn't an answer. It just means we don't have the answer at that time. That had a great impact on my life. You know, sadly, I've met many people over the years who said, when they talk to maybe their Christian leader or even their parents about evolution or millions of years or, or other issues that contradicted the Bible, they were told, well, you know, well, maybe the Bible doesn't really mean that and maybe, maybe you can reinterpret that and so on. And that had an effect on what happened to them in their lives. And so really the way my father stood on the authority of the word of God and my mother uh, had such an impact on us. Well, I ended high school in 1964, grade eight, in high school uniform. I, I really was a cute kid. I mean, here, here I am in the class, look so cute over here, there we are. And for the first time, the textbooks actually presented in that year evolution as fact, millions of years as fact. And you know, I remember talking to my father about that. What's the answer to evolution? What's the answer to, to um, millions of years, to the idea that ape-like creatures turn into people? And I remember my, my father saying, well, I, I, I don't have all the answers there. I don't really know what they found and, and so on, uh, because we didn't have a creation museum. We didn't have an ark encounter. We didn't have all, all the books and DVDs that we have today. We had none of those, but we had God's word. And that's really what my father taught me. And he said, you can't, you can't add evolution to the Bible. I mean, Genesis is the foundation for the rest of the Bible. You ever heard me speak on that? Genesis is the foundation for the gospel. Genesis is the foundation for all of our doctrines. And also, it wasn't just that, but he was most adamant that when you add something to the Bible and try to change it, you're undermining the authority of the word. And he was so adamant on the authority of the word. Do you see why that emphasis comes through so much uh, in what I do and, and how I speak? And I remember him saying again, I don't have all the answers. That doesn't mean there aren't any answers. We need to wait for the answers. And so we had to wait for the answers. Let me, let me tell you a bit about my, uh, some other aspects of my background here. I want to tell you about my grandmother on my mother's side, Nana, and there's granddad, he was such a, a gentleman. Uh, and uh, Nana, there she is with my mother. Uh, she is there dressed for church. And uh, she was such a bold witness for the Lord. And I only knew her when she was you know, in her 70s. And uh, she died in her 80s. My granddad died when he was uh, 90, 94, I believe. They lived at the, at the foot of Mount Bartlefria, the highest mountain in Queensland. I think it's 5,287 feet high. I know because I climbed every foot to get up to the top. <laughs> and uh, perspective doesn't make it look like this, but the top is up where that arrow is right there. It was in a cane farming area there in North Queensland. Uh, it was at a place called Bartlefria, south of Babinda, which is south of Cairns. And that was the old farmhouse built up on stilts. And you can see we visited there uh, during vacation time, holiday time, and we put the caravan there. And see these steps here? I'll never forget this. Because I remember the time when we were there, and I was out on the veranda here, and the Jehovah's Witnesses came visiting. And so, Nana came out. <laughs> and she stood on the top of those stairs, and I, st I can still see her waving her Bible at them and quoting scripture. And I remember them turning around and going down the stairs, and she started walking after them, preaching to them. And as they were running down the road, she was after them, still preaching. I'll never forget that. But those things have an impact on your life when you see that. I remember one time we were there, and um, it was probably when I was just you know, 11, 10 years old. 
I remember my mother, as we're driving up the road, it's in, in a country area, not many houses at all, mainly farmland, and uh, she pointed to a house that was about one and a half miles away from this house, and she told us an interesting story about how she would ride a bicycle down there because there were two girls that the parents didn't send them to Sunday school, and she wanted to take them to Sunday school because she wanted them to hear about Jesus. And she was only a, you know, a, a teenager herself. And when I was back in Australia in 2014, I asked uh, my mother if we could video her. And so we spent a couple of hours videoing her because I wanted, I wanted to get for our own kids and grandkids a lot more about the history of our family and the way we were brought up and the influences and so on. And I said, can you tell me about that time, because I've never forgotten it. It had an impact on me. You know, if my mother did that, what can I do so people can learn about Jesus? So listen to what she said. But then the other thing was, there was two little girls at Bourne Gilly about the mile the other direction, mm -hmm. and they were upset because they couldn't come. They were only little. So I, um, I thought, okay. So I got my father's bike, tied a cushion on the handlebars, and so I'd ride up to Porn on my bike, and I'd put one on the bar and one on the handlebar, and I'd ride right back <laughs> down to the Battle Free Hall. So you'd ride and a mile up to their house, up my collect house, them, then back to the Battle Free And then two mile back to the hall. And then back home. And then two mile take them back home, and then a mile to go back home yourself. Yeah, well, I did that for, I don't know, I can't remember how long I did it for until one day the father says, I better do something about this. So he started running them to Sunday school. I know I did it for a long time. Like and months then, or a year? Oh, or in, in months. And uh, then she said this. You know those two little girls I took on the bike? Uh -huh. A few years ago, they had a reunion at Battlefield School, mm -hmm. quite a few years ago, and I, and I went to it. And, and Beth ran up to me, I didn't know her, and she asked me if I knew her, and she said, oh, do you know me? Oh, no, and she said, I'm Beth Persky. Remember me? I'm a Christian and I still love the Lord. I said, oh, that's lovely. And his little sister came up and said, oh, I've gone away from the Lord, but I promise I'll come back. <laughs> and was it that Sunday school that really helped with that, do you think? Yeah, yeah. And because, yeah. because you put them on, yeah. your, on the bicycle yeah. handle and yeah. took them to that, Sunday school. And yeah, and so I met them those, that few years back and that's what happened. That is, That's that interesting, is. isn't it? Yeah, it is interesting. You know, um, my brother David, who lives in Australia, was there with me when we were filming me Mum back in 2014. And he told me um, a couple of years later, actually, because I, I mentioned that to him and he said, you know, just hearing her say that, because he hadn't heard it when I heard it up there uh, in, 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 the, in North Queensland at the actual farmhouse there. But he said, when she said that, she said, that really impacted me too, knowing my mother did that. Well, another school my father's transferred to was this one outside the town of Innisfail, a school called Mundu. We lived in that house there on the corner. And my parents started a Sunday school there because there was no Sunday school. It was a little country area of Queensland again. And I, I put this photo in here because that was taken there uh, in Mundu. And it's got a couple of people in there that I remember were missionaries because my parents would always have missionaries in the house and they would be helping them to get to the next town to preach the gospel. And I, I know sometimes my parents were looking for the last little bit of money they had in the house to help them get to the next town and things like that. And I don't remember the name of those missionaries, but uh, I know they were always uh, having missionaries uh, in our house and that had an impact on us. And at this school, they started a Sunday school. I know they actually built an extension on that school while I was there. And I remember the Sunday school actually being right in this building here that my parents uh, started. And so when I was at Mundu, this is sort of an embarrassing photo, but I can't believe my mother dressed me like that. I mean, I can understand when I'm 99 years old, I might put shorts on like that, but uh, can you believe she dressed me? And look, my brother, he, she did the same. <laughs> anyway, there I am hiding behind uh, the others. But uh, in, fact, in fact, that's my grandmother on my uh, father's side. And I remember that they attended a church in the city of Brisbane in one of the suburbs there. In fact, I stayed with them for 12 months once uh, when I was going to college. But when I was uh, that age there, about 12 years old, 
My parents invited a missionary from the open air campaigners to come in and it was a special program for children at the church and they would collect children and take them in there of an afternoon for these programs. And this was the church, it was a Presbyterian church at the time. Sadly, it's now a real estate office, which is happening to a lot of church buildings uh, throughout the whole Western world. And I remember the missionary had a challenge for those who wanted to be a missionary for the Lord. And here was the challenge who were willing to go wherever God wanted them to go and do whatever God wanted them to do. And we had to sign a little piece of paper to say we would do that. I remember signing that piece of paper and saying, yes, yes, what my parents have taught me, what they brought me up uh, to understand and believe about God's word and the gospel. Yes, I want to be a missionary for the Lord. I put my faith and trust in the Lord and I want to be a missionary for him. And I was willing to go wherever he wanted me to go and do whatever he wanted me to do. You know the interesting thing? That was in 1961. You know what else happened in 1961? A very famous book was published, The Genesis Flood by Drs. Wickham and Morris, which is the book that really started the modern, a modernist uh, creation uh, movement. Well, I had my photograph taken there uh, at that church a number of years ago when I was there because that was a special event in my life. But unknown to me, uh, there was a young girl born in the city of Brisbane. And she was named Marilyn, spelled M-A-R-Y-L-Y-N. See, most of the staff here don't even know that her real name is Marilyn. Really, Mary Lynn, pronounced Marilyn, but nobody ever calls her Marilyn. They only know her as Mally, because that was a nickname her mother gave her when she was a child, and so they only know her as Mally. In fact, I remember once there was a package turned up at the office for a Marilyn, and everyone said, there's no Marilyn in this. They, they didn't know there was a Marilyn. <laughs> uh, but she was born, well, actually, Here's what's really great. I figured out a way to remember when she was born and the year she was born, right? So whenever I hear them saying, oh, Pearl Harbor Day is coming up, Pearl Harbor Day, 7th of December. My wife was born on the 7th of December. Make a little note, buy a present. And then I think, how old was she? Then I say to myself, when did those scientists, Watson and Crick in England, when did they discover the helical structure of the DNA molecule that was in 1953, so that's how I remember how, how old she is. And now I've told you how old she is, and well, anyway, I'm in trouble. And there she is as a young girl. You know, when she was about, about 10 years old, and uh, you know, sort of about the same age I was, um, when she was about 10 years old, it was about, I was about 10 when, I went, when uh, we went to that church where I made that commitment, actually. Um, so I was 12 years old when I wore the ape costume. Uh, but anyway, uh, she, her mother sent her to Sunday school. She didn't grow up in a Christian home like me, but her, her mother sent her to Sunday school. And at Sunday school, the Sunday school teacher was telling them about the gospel. And um, Mally told me it was many, many years later after we were married that I actually, we were actually talking about this. And she said that, she was listening to the gospel and she said, Lord, if you did that for me, you died on the cross for me. I want to go wherever you want me to go and do whatever you want me to do. And she committed to do that too. And it's interesting, we realized we might both made the same commitment as young children and then God brought us together. Well, in 1970, we moved to Brisbane and uh, that was the house uh, that we lived in. And then we went to this church and this was a Methodist church in a suburb called Sunnybank. And I remember in January 1971, walking up those stairs, and there was a young lady handing out hymn books. And she had a sash on her because at that church, for the young people, they'd had this competition. It, it, uh, the suburb is called Sunnybank, and so it was who was going to be Miss Sunnybank Methodist for the year. And she was Miss Sunnybank Methodist. She had that choice of being Miss Australia, Miss Universe, Miss America, or Miss Sunnybank Methodist. And so it was Miss Sunnybank Methodist. And uh, here she is when we met as a teenager, when she first met my parents. And Mally is a very, very shy person, very reserved person. Uh, and my mother thought she didn't talk when she first met her, but we found out that's very different once she got grandkids. There's a picture of us. Uh, many, many years later, obviously. But we're standing on the seaside. Uh, it was, it's at 
a, a, a seaside area of a suburb called Manly, and it was there where, on October 22nd, 1971, I asked her to marry me. And you say, wow, you remember that date. Yeah, I asked her at breakfast. <laughs> That's the only way I remember those. How, why is it that she knows the, the birth dates of all our grandchildren and our children, and she knows all these dates, and I'm hopeless at that stuff. By the way, guess what, guess what car I had then? We were sitting in a car overlooking the sea here, and there it is, it was a VW, a VW Beetle, a green VW Beetle. <laughs> and uh, that, um, that was uh, the very car that we sat in when I asked her to marry me. And I, I found this in some of my mother's things. Um, my mother is, well, she's, at, at the time of doing this particular presentation, she's 90 years old, turns 91 in February, actually. But this was the wedding invitation for Marilyn, Joan, and Kenneth Alfred. Uh, and there's a wedding photo. And there we are today. We haven't changed a bit. <laughs> I'm still cute and she's still gorgeous. Look at that. Uh, so we had our photo taken at that very church where we first met uh, when we went uh, back a few years ago. It's not a church anymore. Uh, it's, it's actually a theatre now. Uh, but nonetheless, that's where we first met. And so... In 1973, I graduated. That's a, that's a weird graduation gown, isn't it? Anyway, I graduated with a Bachelor of Applied Science uh, in Biology and Environmental Science uh, from the Queensland Institute of Technology, that's today called the Queensland University of Technology. And in 1974, I did a graduate uh, qualification in education to become a teacher. But right up until then, I had never found any books that really had the answers to the issues of evolution and millions of years. And then uh, there was a man in our church who was the president of a teacher's college. His name was Gordon Jones, and he's with the Lord now. And this was particularly mentioned at uh, his funeral, actually. But he had this book somehow, I don't know how, and he gave me this book. And I was reading it because I'd been taught a real evolutionary course at university, and actually the more they taught it, the more I realized this can't be true. It's ridiculous. And then I read this in there. Was death evolved? Since death may occur in all forms of life, the origin of death is unknown apart from revelation. The Bible alone gives us the true story of the entrance of this dread experience in a life. And at the same time, the Bible reveals to us its final conquest. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That, that little book, I still have the very booklet and I put it in uh, our library here at Answers in Genesis. But what really hit me was, of course, if you believe in millions of years, you've got all this death and in the fossil record, there's evidence of diseases and uh, all sorts of horrible things. Wait a minute, how could that exist before sin? Death came after sin. After God made man, he said everything was very good. How can you call a fossil record with all this death and disease very good? And that was such a key point for me. Not that I uh, didn't believe God's word in Genesis, but that was a key point for me to realize, yes, theologically, you can't have death and disease before sin. And then it was interesting that uh, in that same year, uh, that same man, Gordon Jones, told me, he, he said, did you know, I've heard there's a book uh, in America published about the flood. And he said, you need to try to get hold of a copy. He said, because that'll give you lots of answers scientifically in that as well. He said, that's what I've heard. And so I went into our little Christian bookstore in Brisbane. And at that, that time, there, there wasn't much in the way of Christian resources in Australia. And there was a husband and wife who ran this little tiny Christian bookstore. It was called Gospel Book Depot. It was on the second floor of an old building in the city of Brisbane. And I went in there and I said, have you heard about a book in America called The Flood, The Genesis Flood? And the, and, and the man who served me said, yes, I have a copy. And he went to the shelf and pulled off that book and, and came out and I bought it. You know what was fascinating? Because that gave me some answers. I know my, my father was excited at the answers there too in regard to geology and so on. Many years later, when I was over in Australia, I was at one of the animal parks and there was an elderly lady there. And she recognized me. I didn't recognize her, but she recognized me. And then when she came up and talked to me, I realized she was the wife of the man who ran that Christian bookstore. And her husband had gone to be with the Lord. She's gone to be with the Lord now too. 
And we got talking and I told her I remembered them and that I bought the book The Flood from them. And we talked about the ministry we're in because she'd heard about the ministry and what was happening with, with our ministry. And she looked at me and she said, did you know, she said, my husband had a real burden to have that book in the bookstore. She said, it's something he said he couldn't explain. He just knew he had to have it there. And I thought, wow, see how God uses all these different people and circumstances. You don't even find out about many of them until later on. Well, in 1975, uh, I was appointed to be a high school science teacher in the town of Dolby, which is about two and a half hours west of the city of Brisbane, up on the Darling Downs, a wheat growing area. And uh, so I began teaching there. And one of my first science classes, because kids knew I was a Christian, because I was down to be uh, in charge of the Christian group in the school. And uh, uh, some of the students said to me, sir, we heard you're a Christian. How can you be a Christian when we know the Bible's not true? And I said, how do you know the Bible's not true? And they said, because of what our textbooks teach us about evolution. And then I was asked the question, sir, how, how could you believe in Noah's Ark? We know he couldn't fit the animals on board. And so I realized this was a stumbling block to them. And in those days we had all the freedom you needed to be able to teach them. And so I taught them about evolution, but then I also taught them why it was wrong. And I taught them uh, about uh, creation and the flood. And uh, it's interesting, I have met a few of those students many years later in, in different places. And I'd, they come up and tell me who they were. And uh, I've heard of at least three testimonies now of, of those people who said they became Christians later in life, but they remember back to that time when I taught them about God's word in school and had a big impact on them. And I also remember the day when I talked to them about the Tower of Babel and that we're all descendants of Adam and Eve through Noah and we're all one family, we're all one race, aren't any different races of people? And, and this was back in 1975. And some of the Australian Aboriginal students uh, from the Australian Aboriginal people group came up afterwards and said, sir, please tell us more. And then I realized as I started to study it, Darwin in his book, The Descent of Man, said the Australian Aborigines are closer to the apes than those with light skin. And they were treated terribly in Australia. In fact, scientists uh, sent people to Australia to hunt down the Aborigines, herd them into swamps, herd them over cliffs to kill them. They paid property owners to go on their property and do this. And they had instructions on how to skin them and boil up their skulls as specimens all in the name of evolution. And that's why ever since that time, I've had that burden concerning telling people we're all one race. And you'll see it in the exhibits of the Creation Museum. You'll see it uh, in the Ark. And you'll also see we have a couple of books. A book uh, just came out with for children, One Blood uh, for Children, which is really good for mums and dads and everyone. The book One Race, One Blood, that I did with an African-American pastor. And I, and I have presentations I give on this because I was sort of shocked when I came to America and saw the prejudice in the church in America. It just blew my mind. And, and even back then, I understood we're all the same skin color. Uh, we, we just have different amounts of pigment melanin. Well, you know, I was taking my students uh, to animal parks and museums, but they were always from an evolutionist perspective. And, you know, I quote Jeremiah 29, where Jeremiah said, in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones and I'm weary with holding it in and I cannot, God started to give me that fire in my bones. Why can't we have a creation museum? Well, I started to research more to find some more books. Actually, I actually came across a copy of the Genesis record by Dr. Morris and actually that helped me develop what we call the relevance of Genesis message that we give, the importance of the book of Genesis because he dealt with that theologically in that book. Our first child, Nathan, was born in 1976 in the town of Dolby, and that's the pastor and his wife there holding uh, Nathan. And the, the reason I want I to put that photo there too is not just because that's our, that was our firstborn, but because our pastor, Jim Kitson, who's remained a really good friend of ours, we love to see him when we go to Australia, he and his wife Kay, and he asked me to speak in the church in 1975, and I decided to do it on creation apologetics. So I, I, I did my first ever creation apologetics talk in 1975. If I went back and listened to me then, I probably would never employ me in Answers in Genesis, believe me. Well, that was when I first uh, spoke on the topic of uh, creation evolution, creation apologetics, and then I was asked by some of the other churches to come and speak. And I started to, and I found most Christians didn't know that you could believe the book of Genesis. 
And in fact, they had all these questions about, what, 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 wait a minute, what, what about the days and so on? And what do you do with millions of years? And I realized they didn't have the answers. And so the Lord kept that fire burning and intensified it. Well, I was transferred to a, a big school in the city of Brisbane, and we moved there after two years in Dolby, and we moved there in December uh, 1976. And that, that house um, has, has a number of special memories for us. Uh, for instance, take uh, our daughter, Renee, who was born on February 25th, 1978. She's right down the front down here right now. Um, so Renee was born in that house, on the lounge, not by choice. <laughs> so my wife went into labor, and I called the ambulance. And just because of what was happening, I tried to convince them. I said, I, I, think, this is, I think this is happening really quickly. You need to get here. And I remember them saying, now, Mr. Ham, is it your first or your second? Yes, yes, yes. We under I said, I tell you, something's happening. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, I was out the front looking for the ambulance, and Mally screams at me, and I run in, and what am I going to do? There's a baby. <laughs> the baby coming. She basically delivered herself, actually. But I grabbed hold of, of this baby, and I had no idea what to do. No, I, I've been trained in any of this stuff. What do I do? Do you know what I did? This is actually true. I thought, I've seen movies <laughs> where they grab them by the legs and whack them on the bottom. And that's exactly what I did. I went whack. And I heard this cry. Oh, good, that worked. <laughs> uh, and, and then I thought, aren't you supposed to do something with the cord? And so I took my boot laces out. I couldn't find any string and tied the cord. Now what do I do? Well, I, in, in the meantime, I'd sent someone screaming for my mother who lived around the corner, and she, she grabbed another lady who was a midwife, and they were there, and she raced down, and, and she helped fix everything up and, and, and so on. And then the ambulance finally came, and they were sort of in shock. And uh, so they took, took her in the ambulance, took us in the ambulance, and we got to the hospital, and we get there, and um, we, we pull in, and the nurses were there to meet us and so on. And one of the nurses said, oh, is it a boy or a girl? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I didn't look. I don't know. And uh, I said to, I said to Mally later, did you, know, did you know it was a girl? She said, of course I knew it was a girl. <laughs> well, I, guess, I guess you know to do those things. I, I didn't know. So anyway, so uh, then when our third child was born, Danielle, and my wife, my, Mally was so sure this was a boy. She said, I, I just think it's a boy. And anyway, I, she woke up in the middle of the night, and I know, if you, I, I just realized, if, if there's anything she says, oh, I feel a bit different, what? Ambulance. <laughs> so I called the ambulance, got her into hospital, and she took about, was it 35 minutes, 40 minutes, 35 minutes? Yeah, so I don't know. She, she, you need to patent how you deliver these kids. That's incredible. And so we we'd thought about the name Daniel. She really liked the name Daniel. And uh, she also told the nurse, you know, well, we think it's a boy and we'll call, uh, call him Daniel, but otherwise, you know, it'd be Danielle. And the nurse said to her after, after the baby was born, well, it's not a Daniel, it's a Danielle. <laughs> so we had Danielle. And then there was Jeremy. Jeremy's down the front here too. Big, long, tall, lanky Jeremy. Mally woke up during the night, middle of the night, and she said, my back is a little tight. Ambulance. <laughs> I said, and I remember saying to him, listen, the first time I called you, I had to deliver the baby myself. I'm not delivering another one. <laughs> Ding dong, they were there at the door. I'm, I mean, that, the ambulance was just around the corner, really, from where we lived. And so we got in the ambulance, and she, sat in the, she lay in the back, and I'm in there with her. And he says, uh, and she said, oh, I had a labor pain. Oh, okay, we'll count them and I'll keep a record for the hospital. So we're zooming along. She had three labor pains, took 11 minutes, and they had to pull the ambulance off the side of the road under that tree right there. <laughs> it was on a hill overlooking the city of Brisbane, and the ambulance guy goes, said, come and help me. And we raced around the back, and we delivered Jeremy. There he, there's Jeremy, when we went to Australia a number of years ago with, with their firstborn, uh, Josiah. And so we always go and visit the tree. And, 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 
And as I said to Mally, look, it, it was really nice because the back of the doors were open and you could see across the city in the moonlight. It was, it was, a, it was a very nice actual place. Yes. Yeah, we have some stories about all of our kids, actually. So um, just as something else to do, um, Mally and I also uh, started singing groups. And we had a group called Faith Proclaimers and Mally was an alto, and her sister was a soprano, and we had some other, other friends in it, one of my sisters in it. In fact, we had three sort of modifications of that group, actually, over time. We were very, very famous. I'm sure you've heard of us. <laughs> famous around the world, in fact. Well, there are some churches in Australia that heard of us back then. So, and, and actually, I composed some of the songs for them, actually made those songs up. And uh, I used one of them and modified it as a song for the Christian school that uh, our daughter Renee started in this area called Twelve Stones. And it's their theme song. So if you want to hear Ken Ham music, you have to go to the school and listen to their theme song. So in 1977, right after we moved to Brisbane, we looked like this. Very similar to how we look today. <laughs> as you can see. Well, Mally hasn't changed, but... So, in 1977, I and another school teacher that I'd met, John Mackay, organized the first Creation Apologetics Conference ever in Australia. And I had been trying to find books to have answers. And these were the first books that I obtained. There was one from Singapore by Professor Orr, the Genesis Record, the Genesis Flood, uh, with Dr. Morris, Dr. Morris and Dr. Wickham, uh, Professor Enoch from India, that little uh, yellow book that came from uh, England, and another one that came from England, Bone of Contention. And what happened was I displayed those books, and people who came to the conference looked at the books and said, how do we get these? We need these answers. We need these books. And actually, this is all part of the ministry starting in Australia. Like my father, you know, that righteous anger. Well, why doesn't somebody do something about this? So Mally and I talked about it, and we decided to start a bookstore. We called it Creation Science Supplies. And this is a house where Renee was born. But initially, there wasn't this little enclosed area on the patio. And uh, we had my brother-in-law actually enclose that for us, and we started a bookstore in there. And we started importing books. And it's one of the reasons why I've always had an emphasis in Answers in Genesis and, and the Creation Museum and the Ark on, on resources. And all the curricula we have, and the DVDs, and all the books, and getting people to author books because I knew how much those answers meant to me. And you see that influence today in the incredible number of publications that we have. Now, it was interesting. We found out that uh, there was a publisher in America called Master Books, and they published the Creation Apologetics books of Henry Morris. And we couldn't get them in Australia. And there was one of the Institute for Creation Research in San Diego, that's the organization that Dr. Morris started, one of their speakers was coming to Australia. His name was Harold Slusher, actually, and he did a tour in 1978 in Sydney and Melbourne. And I wanted to go down there to be with him, but I wanted to have some books there so people had books. And so I remember talking to Master Books and saying, oh, we've got an exclusive agency with a book distributor in Australia. I called the book distributor. They only had one book. I thought, that's hopeless. So I called them back and they said, no, we've got an exclusive agency, I'm sorry. I said, but we need these books. I had no idea what to do, but I had a creationist publication from America that listed all these scientists that were creationists. You know what I did? Remember the old days of telegrams? I just thought, okay, I'll just put some pressure on them. You know, never take no for an answer. Some of the staff will start to understand. I've always had that philosophy. Never take no for an answer. There's always a, a way around something. And so I sent telegrams to all these people and said, help us, we need books in Australia to teach people the answers about creation. And I sent them to all these different people, they had no idea who I was. So, and then I, got a, I ended up getting a phone call from the manager of, the, of Master Books, who said to me, I've had all these people calling me, you've been, you know, he didn't say harassing, but it meant that. All these people in America, he said, what, so what do you want? I said, we need books. They don't have them over here. I've got an exclusive. I know, but we need them. And, you know, this man's coming over to speak, this scientist. And he said, I, I tell you what, got back to me. He said, I'll give you one, one order. You can have one order. So we sat down and thought, how much can we order? And I added up, you know, all these numbers of books and things. Come to $20,000. That was like $10 million to us. $20,000. And you know, what, you know what? Mally agreed to this. Said, we need to order them because we need those books. Do you know how much money we had in the bank? 
That's all we had. So I ordered the books. And then we sent letters out to people and said, help. <laughs> We've ordered these books. You're our friends. Can you help us? We need to raise money to pay for them. I tell you what was interesting. The bill was due by a particular date, and I know we had, had a, a couple of days to go, and I had to have that money. And we had actually raised 17000 of the $20,000. Some people loaned us interest-free. I didn't even know why they trusted us, but they did. And then Mally and I were sitting on the front porch of this house, and we're saying, we've got 3000 to go. How are we going to get 3000 And we, of course, been praying about it, and a car pulls up. And a man came out of the car and he walked up to me, had an envelope, and he said, my wife and I have been really burdened to help you get this material into Australia. He said, here's our contribution. It was $3,000. You know, I call them Red Sea events. And we've had a number of Red Sea events over the years. Well, the ministry started to grow. We had a room on the back of the house. And as we founded our ministry in Australia, uh, this man here, Professor John Reynolds Short, he was Professor of Child Health at Queensland University and an ardent creationist. He was from England and uh, studied at Oxford University. And we, we, we met him through some people and he agreed to be our founding chairman. He was actually honoured by the Queen with the Order of Australia because he diagnosed autism. And he was a creationist and our founding chairman. And so the ministry started to grow, and so we moved into this warehouse. It's interesting, we're in this side here. See this door, roller door here? See how the building goes down here? And so the only vehicle we could afford, and we, it, was, it was an old vehicle and it was nearly worn out, was this old one with that big high back on it. And the way we used to do this, I, I would travel all over Australia speaking, so we would load up that truck with books and it'd be in the back of the warehouse here, and then I would rev it up and tear up here, because I only had a four-cylinder motor, and we'd just make it up onto here. <laughs> One day I did that, and because it has a high back, and I was just sitting in the front looking out, I thought the door was open, but it was like there. And I come tearing out of there, and there's this incredible explosion, and bang, and everybody in the whole neighborhood comes out to have a look. I'd rip the whole door out of the building. But anyway, that, that truck gave up and we needed a vehicle to be able to travel all over Australia. And so um, we found this vehicle. But it was the, I, think, I think the price, if my memory serves me correctly, um, uh, I think it was $13,000. And that was a fortune to us. And we we're actually meeting in that particular warehouse as a board and we we're praying and praying the Lord would let us have the money to buy this vehicle so I could travel all over Australia speaking. And the phone rang. And I picked it up, and it was a businessman who said, listen, I've got a little extra cash at the moment. Um, any particular project you've got, he said, because I've got $13,000. It was the exact amount. And that's the vehicle we bought. And we also traveled all over Australia, dragging this trailer as well. And I, I spoke uh, traveling across uh, Australia uh, speaking. In 1979, it got to that stage, I couldn't keep school teaching and speaking. I would leave school Friday afternoon and we'd travel overnight to Sydney or Melbourne. And I mean, you're talking a lot of traveling and traveling all over. And we were talking about whether I should go full time or not. And we had no base, you know, no money to go full time and how, how are we going to do all this? And um, we were on the way back to Dolby to visit our friends in that town where I first started teaching, where our son Nathan was born. And Mally was reading this. She's sitting in the passenger seat reading. Matthew 6.25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, nor what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? And, you know, look at the birds of the air, etc. And uh, which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour of span to your life? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, nor spin. Yet tell you, even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of a little faith? And we made the decision then, because we had previously said, Lord, we're willing to do this, but you know how you 89% mean it, 91% mean it, 95% mean it? Right there in the cars we're driving, we 100% meant it. Said, Lord, we're willing to go full time. And so I resigned from school teaching. There's a whole other interesting backstory to all of that, um, which I don't have time to tell you in, in, in this particular presentation. 
This is how we dressed back then. I would go preaching in churches in shorts and long socks. <laughs> I want to introduce that uniform here in America <laughs> at Answers in Genesis. Well, you know what's interesting? I went full time in October 1979, and even God provided, it was interesting because I resigned from school, and the principal said, We're well, going to leave these kids in the lurch. It's towards the end of the year. And he said, he said, you, you know, you, you really need to have a teacher to replace you. And someone called up that school and said they were a teacher and they wanted to come and get a job there as a science teacher. And uh, so he said, hey, someone, someone wants, wants to be a science teacher here. So it was interesting. That person then pulled out a little later on and the principal came back to me and said, well, they pulled out. Would you reconsider? And I thought, you know what? We've made this commitment. We just have to trust God's going to provide a person for them. And someone did. Another teacher came on. But in a way, I think that was a little test, too, to see if we really were committed. John and Esther Thallon. John was one of our board members. In about 1980, he knew about my burden to build a creation museum. And so he and, he and I were on a piece of property in Australia and prayed God would let us build a creation museum. We didn't, had no idea that prayer would be answered many years later, but in a different country. And you know, in 1989, 86, Master Books had asked if I would come over and uh, do some speaking around the country to, uh, in churches. And because I had the apologetics books in America, and so I did that, uh, went over there on tour. Uh, that's us in 1984. Then in 1986, an organization called Films for Christ from Arizona asked if I would come over. And Dale Mason, uh, who is actually one of our staff members and is one of our VPs, uh, Dale was with Films for Christ, and his uh, mother-in-law was uh, one of the people in charge of Films for Christ. And he would drive a van and drag this big trail, and he and I traveled across America for six months speaking in churches while Mally and the kids stayed in, uh, in the house in uh, Arizona, in Tempe, Arizona. And, oh, sorry, Chandler. It was Chandler where we stayed. And then in 1986, they, Films for Christ, they, that was when you had the 16 millimeter films. They filmed me speaking at Grace Community Church in Tempe, Arizona, and they made it into a documentary called The Genesis Solution that was made available in 1987. And so I want to show you a couple of little excerpts from that, from that film. It was shown to th in thousands of churches across America uh, back then. And uh, so they actually decided to put some animation. This was cutting edge animation at the time. Okay.
I was really warning the church back there, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's happening. And you look at that and realize that's exactly what's happened. You think about it. By the way, we still have the kangaroo. <laughs> He's in the zoo down at the ark. You can see him down there. And I also want to show you this. Back then, to me it was very simple. If you don't start with God's word, then anything goes. And how important it is to be found in God's word. I want to show you the message has never changed. You know, it's very sad that this whole philosophy of everyone has a right to their own opinion so permeates our society and even our churches. And we need to really understand the right way to think. You know, there was a group in Australia started up once called Toleration. They wanted to promote a tolerance of all religious ways, beliefs and doctrines. And they put out a promotional leaflet to promote this tolerance of all beliefs. You know, we've got to stop being intolerant of other people's beliefs. On the first page of their promotional leaflet, they listed all the things they were against. But they wanted a tolerance of all beliefs. You know, this whole idea of teaching a tolerance of all beliefs, which also permeates our education system, what's it saying? We've got to tolerate everyone's religious ways, beliefs and doctrines. So what happens when Christians come along and say, hang on, here's what's right and here's what's wrong. God sets the rules. Oh, no, we can't tolerate that. We've got to tolerate all beliefs. Do you see what they've done? They've been intolerant of the absolutes of Christianity because the absolutes of Christianity are intolerant of their philosophy which says everything can be done in accord with one's own opinion. How many people fight it at the issue level instead of saying, hang on, God's the creator, he sets the rules, let's see what his word says. The reason I'm against abortion is because God is creator, his word tells me, Psalm 139, Psalm 51, many other places, at the point of conception you're human, therefore abortion is killing. We are not the product of chance random processes. We are not just animals. God created us. What I'm saying is if we don't fight the issues at a foundational level, even if we get the laws changed today in regard to abortion or pornography, what happens when the next generation comes through who so believe evolution even more and reject creation and Christianity, won't they just change the laws back again? We have to fight it at a foundational level. There's a war on. There's a war in society. It's Christianity versus humanism. But you know, at a foundational level, it really is creation versus evolution. You know, the whole creation-evolution issue is not just a side issue. It's one of the most fundamental, important issues of today. And if Christians don't grasp what the foundational issues are, we're not going to be successful in the long run in evangelising society. It's the same message we're giving today, isn't it? And in many ways, you, you look at that, it's a warning for the church back then. Well, in 1986, Dr. Henry Morris approached me and asked if I'd come over to America and help them at the Institute for Creation Research. And so, you know, a board degree, a lot of prayer went into it. But in 1987, that's when we moved over. That was our family then. Uh, our four children moved over to the USA. Uh, we lived in California. And on February uh, 25th, uh, 1988, uh, our fifth child was born, Christelle. And there she is when she's 18 months old. And there she is today. And there she is today, down here. And she's the only one of our family who is still single <laughs> as of giving this presentation. <laughs> she's a good cook, by the way. Uh, so uh, there we are with our five children uh, in our present day. And then at about that time, uh, Professor John Reynolds Short, who came from England, asked if I would go over and do some speaking in the United Kingdom because he was so burdened for the United Kingdom. And I went over there and, and he pleaded with me to keep the ministry going in the United Kingdom. We have a ministry there today, actually. And I remember visiting the National History Museum in London and seeing all these school kids going in there. And there's one particular uh, event that occurred when there was a father with his little child, I'd say probably seven, eight years old, standing there. And he said, These were, this, this was your ancestor. Uh, telling him that, you know, Lucy, she's one of your relatives. And then you read signs like this in the museums there. Some of us think we humans have a special place in the animal kingdom. Uh, however, the human genome is similar to a chimpanzee's, a lot in common with the genome of a fruit fly. You, you know, you have no put more purpose than a fruit fly. And then the myth of a global flood. Guess what the Lord did? He put that fire more and more in my heart. We've got to have a creation museum. And so working at the Institute of Creation Research for seven years, uh, there also God brought along Mark Loy and Mike Zoveth, and Mike's here tonight down uh, on the front there. And they shared that burden with me, 
And so we determined we're going to build a creation museum. So instead of me returning to Australia after seven years, uh, we decided to move to northern Kentucky. We'd already done research. We wanted a place that was central to the population. And it was close to where Mike uh, grew up as well. And then uh, we also asked two people that we knew, uh, Dan Manti and Don Landis, to, to be on the board with us. So they were our, our founding board members, other than the three of us. Of course, they looked very different back then. Uh, the most reached fossil status today. Uh, so <laughs> now I'm really in trouble, aren't I? That's what we looked like back then, and that's what we looked like when we opened the Creation Museum. And so we moved to Kentucky, and we went to this uh, strip mall that had a vacant place there. We had nothing when we moved out here, uh, but we, we uh, went here and there was a pharmacist that owned it. None of the Mike remembers. We were talking to him and we said, we're just a new organization. We're Christian and we don't have any money, and, you know, but we'll, 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 we'll pay the lease and so on. And I remember him saying, he wasn't a Christian, he said, oh, your God will look after you. And he let us rent the place. And uh, Master Books actually helped us by uh, shipping books to different places for our conferences. And it was interesting. Uh, at, at some stage, uh, we, Master Books was, well, you know, there's very few uh, publishing, uh, Christian publishing companies, uh, privately owned in America that are left. And Master Books was one of them. And uh, so to, for it to continue, uh, they were looking for someone to take it over. And so Tim Dudley, who had uh, a, a publishing company called New Leaf, looked at, into purchasing it. And I remember talking to him on the phone from here in Kentucky and pleading with him, we need somebody who's behind this ministry to do this because the big publishing companies won't publish all the books we want to publish and they won't keep them in print long. Anyway, that's another whole interesting story, the way God brought uh, him uh, to us. And uh, uh, so he and the, the other uh, people with him agreed to buy Master Books. And that has been one of the great blessings of this ministry for us to publish of all those materials. So we established the ministry here in Kentucky in those offices. And then uh, we ran a seminar in Mount Vernon in 1994. And we met up with Buddy Davis. He came to the seminar and Buddy and Kay invited us back to their log cabin there in Hempack, Ohio. And we found that Buddy sculpted dinosaurs. And he and his wife Kay wanted to see their dinosaurs in something like a creation museum. And uh, so we talked about it, and I told him my burden for a creation museum, and that's why we came to Kentucky. And I saw a guitar on the wall, and I asked, I asked Buddy if he would play it, and he didn't want to at first, but then he, then he played a song for us called He Makes Dreams Out of Nothing. I said, Buddy, when we open the creation museum, you're going to sing that song. Guess what? That's exactly what happened. And I'm going to get him to sing that for you uh, a little later. And his dinosaurs today are on display in the Dino Den in the creation museum. So our staff started to grow. As you can see here, we even moved out into bigger premises on Industrial Road here in Florence, Kentucky. We were running conferences across the nation. Our staff continued to grow. And then we stepped out to buy a piece of property and get it rezoned for the Creation Museum. And boy, did we run into trouble. The atheists in the area were really upset that we were doing this. And they caused a lot of problems. And uh, so it got in the newspapers. and. We found out, we didn't even know this, but the atheist accuses us, you're deliberately doing this because this piece of property was a few miles from Big Bone Lick where they discovered mastodon uh, fossils and they were all upset that we would dare build a creation museum near Big Bone Lick. And in fact, there are all sorts of interesting head headlines like Adam versus the mastodons and, and so on. And so because of the influence of the atheists, the then very liberal uh, fiscal court uh, rejected the, the, the creation museum, overruled the zoning, which is, you know, sort of, they normally don't do that. And uh, so I remember the newspaper reporter saying to me, well, are you giving up? I said, absolutely not. And so there we are, Genesis Group undaunted. And uh, so because, because we knew God had something better for us. And so because of what the atheists did, we ended up with a far better property, the one we're on right now. What men meant for evil, God meant for good. And so we, we approached the owners. We had no money. And they wanted half a million dollars for this property that, was, that today is worth millions of dollars. And we asked them, could we buy the property and pay it off at 100000 a year and no interest? And they agreed. I have no idea. Yes, I do know why they agreed, because God had them to agree. And uh, so in November 21, 1998, we had a prayer meeting to raise money uh, and for, for, for the uh, land. And we closed on the land May 5th in the year 2000. And then uh, someone in the area 
who was really thrilled we're here, worked for an architectural company and asked the, the head of the architectural company if they would do the architectural work for us. And so they designed uh, the building uh, for us. And so these are some of the uh, initial renderings. March 17th, 2001, we had the groundbreaking. And uh, there you can see uh, the machinery moving in there in 2001. And there's Mike Zoberth and I looking at uh, all that's going on here. In the meantime, our ministry continued to grow. And another person God brought into our ministry was Brad Bembo from uh, Joseph David Advertising, JDA Worldwide. Uh, Joseph David, um, meaning, you know, interpreter of dreams, ready to fight. And we had a dream and we were ready to fight. And JDA has helped take our marketing to a whole level that we would never thought possible. The billboards, the ads on TV, and we would never thought that possible. And most Christian organizations don't have that ability. And we praise the Lord that he brought them um, into our ministry. And then uh, the museum continued to, uh, uh, to be built here. We had a lot of famous people visit while it was building, like uh, the late Jerry Falwell, uh, who visited and wanted to see what we are doing. And he was thrilled with it. And uh, there's the three of us in suits pretending we're working. Uh, Mark Loy, Mike, and myself. And then in 2001, Mike heard from a guy called Patrick Marsh, who was in Japan at the time, who heard from a newspaper report that we're building a creation museum, and he'd worked for Universal Studios and other theme parks around the world, and he wanted to know if he could come and be our designer. And Mike sent back and said, yes. <laughs> But his computer wasn't working, and he didn't know that Mike had responded. He came over and visited his brother in Indiana, went back to Japan, and then saw the email, and so contacted us, and then uh, we brought him over here, and he did a model of the museum. He was really upset that we'd already designed the building. You don't do it that way. You, you, you design a building for the message. We just designed a building. We had no idea how we are going to design a museum. We just knew we were going to do it. And uh, Patrick said, no, you don't do it that way. Well, we do. And... Uh, God brought in all these phenomenal designers. I mean, just, uh, it's just miraculous. And uh, there I am with Patrick. Um, Patrick's right down here on the front. And uh, the Lord brought him to us. And I handed him the script for the message of the seven seas. Go to it, Patrick. And he and the designers, and he headed up all that, of course, and the brilliance that God has given him, and turned it into what you see today, and the same at the ark. And then another man that came along, Tim Schmidt, who lives in this area as a horticulturalist, very talented horticulturist, said, I want to use my talents for the Lord. And so he came in and did all the gardens, and now he has a big horticultural center at the Ark, and God has used him in a mighty way. And there's the four of us, uh, Patrick on the left, Mike Zobath, myself, and Mark Loy, uh, uh, on the 10th anniversary of the Creation Museum as we were discussing our history. And uh, I put a picture of Mark here specifically, because when you watch these short videos here, um, you'll hear Mark, you won't see him. And he's the one that has done the radio program with me for years and years and years. And so people knew his voice, but they never knew him. If they hear him speak, you're the voice. Uh, but this gives you a recap. Hi, I'm Ken Ham. You know, God has something very special in store for this beautiful property. In the next few minutes, I want to share with you about an exciting project that's going to equip Christians, build them up in their faith, teach them to be able to have answers for the world and to be able to show that the Bible can be taken seriously and really is the Word of God. And it's also going to challenge non-Christians, witness to them for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to discover how you can be a part of this phenomenal project. Here's what the world needs. Wouldn't it be a tremendous blessing to walk into a major 50,000 square foot center where visitors can learn that the Bible is true and that the Christian faith can be logically defended? Imagine walking into a creation museum and seeing the Bible's authority upheld and the gospel powerfully proclaimed, but not promoting evolution or millions of years, instead giving answers to these things. Answers in Genesis will build a family teaching center and museum that will provide visitors with answers from the Bible. It could impact millions of lives. Just a few miles south of Cincinnati and within 600 miles of two-thirds of the U.S. population, Answers in Genesis has already purchased an ideal piece of land for a world-class creation museum, family center, and nature park to proclaim biblical truths and the gospel. The fact that, what, 20 years ago, I and a friend of mine knelt down on a piece of property in Australia and prayed for that property 
to house a creation museum. You know, the Lord didn't answer the prayer that way. We didn't know what would happen. We didn't have any money or anything like that. The ministry was nowhere near as advanced or mature as it is today. And yet 20 years later, the Lord answers that prayer in a way we would never have imagined. Here we have a property in an area in America, the greatest Christian country on earth, within a one day drive and a one and a half hour flight of two thirds of America's population with an international airport so people from all over the world can come here. 50 acres, beautiful acres, with a three acre lake, wooded areas for nature trails, with frontage on a major interstate so that we can outreach to the world. This, this whole project is really a miracle. So people say to me, when? When will it be open? I tell them, hey, it's a $17 million question. It's got a unique property, it's a unique building, we have unique exhibits, we have a unique message for, for the world. And, and I believe that what's happening here is not just something that, you know, a few people in the local area will know about. We already have people all across the world asking about the Creation Museum. It's had international attention. Yeah, there isn't anything like this any place in the whole world. I mean, you think about this, there are probably a lot of small creation museums, little backyard museums, things that people have around in trailers and what have you, but nobody has ever tried to do anything on this scale to really create a full-fledged, professional, uh, high-level museum to be able to tell the story. And that's what's so incredible about it is I think on this level it's going to be able to change so many people's minds about creationism and I mean, the Bible and getting them back an, to the Word. It's an in-your-face kind of approach. We're right on 275 and we're basically saying here it is, world, come after it. it. We're going to present you with information that you can't hide under a basket. You can't censor it by not publishing it in a magazine or putting it on the air. I see the creation ministry and what it's doing in the world today really akin to what Martin Luther did at the time of the Reformation. Because what Martin Luther did was basically affect the whole world. And he was dealing with a problem right there and then in regard to the Word of God, that people needed to get back to the Word of God and away from the opinions of men. And I see the creation ministry and what we're doing at Answers in Genesis, what the Creation Museum is doing, is akin to what Martin Luther did because we're really confronting the church. We're saying to the church, hey, we've got to get back to the Word of God in this area in Genesis where you have the whole history that's foundational to all our doctrine, to the, to the rest of the Bible. And this is where the Bible has been attacked through the universities and the schools and the media, and it's attacked daily. And this is why so many people today no longer listen to the Bible when you're preaching the message of the gospel. And we're also confronting the world and telling the world what you believe about the history of the universe is wrong. And this is the true history of the world. All of the events that are going to be happening inside, we want to have an effect on people, not just for them to have fun, but to actually change their point of view, to rethink about how they look at the Bible and about the truth of it, and to really revisit you know, Genesis 1 through 11. We live in an interesting era of history. We see the battle between Christianity and humanism in, in, in a way that, that, that burdens us and, and, and we realize there's something dreadful going on in this nation. England's already lost its Christian basis and we see the Ten Commandments being ripped out of courthouses and schools and we see the education system that's become so atheistic and we see America as a nation losing its Christian morality and becoming less Christian every day. We need to do something about this. The message that the Lord has laid on the heart of those in Answers in Genesis and through the Creation Museum is the message I believe for this age. And you know, those who support this ministry and those who support the Creation Museum, they're a part of it. It's not just our museum. I want people to understand that. It's not just Answers and Genesis Museum. It's your museum. It's our museum. It's God's people together who are going to provide this for the world. I encourage you, be a part of this exciting project. And you know, while we were building the Creation Museum in 2004, we were working with Brad Bember and Joseph David advertising on a strategic plan. Number seven was build the ark. And uh, because we knew that was a big issue to help people understand the reality of that and how big the ark was and how Noel got the animals on board. And so in 2005, in our strategic plan, number one strategy was build the ark. And so the time came for the opening of the Creation Museum, um, May 26, 2007. May. 26th, 
2007. The Creation Museum is officially open on account of three, two, two one. one. And the atheists gathered outside, had a rock band out there, and they put up, like on this porta potty, and it's probably a good place for that sign, uh, they put that sign there. And then they hired a plane uh, that dragged a banner across our opening ceremony saying, thou shalt not lie. I met many peop people years later who were there at the opening ceremony who thought we hired the plane to say that about the atheists. But uh, anyway, it sort of backfired on them and they put up these signs out there. Uh, they they um, kept opposing us and the ministry keeps growing uh, and growing and growing. And of course, uh, the next project was the Ark and here we are with Patrick. Uh, and, and others talking about uh, the Ark. And it was interesting because Patrick complained that we'd already designed the building for him to put the museum in. I said, God already designed the Ark with the dimensions. He was teaching you a lesson, getting you ready. <laughs> and so November 12, 2015, uh, Dr. Whitcomb, co-author of the Genesis Flood, who loves our ministry, was with us when we announced that it would be open to the public July 7, 2017. I remember that day very well because I was there right after we had the press uh, conference and there were people lined up to interview me and the phone rang and it was Renee, our daughter, who said, I had to call my dad because uh, Bodhi, her husband, had had a heart attack. And uh, so that was hard to do those interviews and that and wondering what on earth is going on. And he had one of those heart attacks that only uh, less than 1% of people survive. And there's Bodhi sitting right over there. Uh, so. So God has preserved him this far. And uh, no, he's preserved him for his family and for the ministry, I believe. But he's a very important part of the ministry of Answers in Genesis. And so then uh, July 5th, 2016. I remember years ago, there was a man called Joshua. He led the people of Israel across the Jordan River. And then God told them to take 12 stones and to build a memorial as a reminder so that the coming generations would not forget who God is and to also be a reminder to the world. The ark is to be a reminder. We build it as a reminder. It's our 12 stones to remind the coming generations of the truth of God's word. It's our way of presenting the truth of God's word and the gospel to the world. And the atheists were outside protesting again. And there they are. They said, this fable won't float. Actually, I agree with that. The bathtub oak arc won't float. We even had an exhibit about that inside. Uh, so, and here it is today, and the big conference center here, the 2500 uh, seat auditorium and workshop area and the zoo at the back. And we light it up with the rainbow lights. You know, my father, every time he saw a rainbow, he would tell the ch uh, us as children, that's, that's a reminder that God will never send another global flood. And so I found a, a picture of the rainbow my father took many years ago of the cane fields in Australia. And so at Christmas time, we really light uh, the ark up and we have our Christmas programs at the ark and uh, the Creation Museum. You know, again, I want to get back to this. A good man leaves a legacy, an inheritance to his children, to his children. And uh, it's, it's really a legacy of parents. Uh, and it should be a challenge to all of us as to what legacy we're leaving. You know, here at the Creation Museum, we have a special exhibit uh, because um, my father and mother taught us to stand unashamedly, boldly, and uncompromisingly on the authority of the Word of God. And that's my father's Bible in there with his notes in there. A little Noah's Ark he built me many, many years ago, not knowing one day we would uh, build a life-size Ark, but because he knew that that stood for something, our stand on the Word of God. And there's a picture of my mother. Uh, and my father. And really their legacy is summed up by this. It's the message of the Ark, the Creation Museum, and Answers in Genesis. At night, you can see the cross lit up on the door. And when you go inside, one of the places where people like to have their photographs taken is at the door with that illuminated cross there. Shows up more on a smartphone, actually. And it's a reminder, there's no one his family went through a door, we need to go through a door, and that door's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we had our photograph with all of our family now, there we are with uh, all of our 16 grandchildren. There they are. And if you look carefully, we still have the kangaroo. <laughs> and 
Uh, I've sort of made an executive decision here. I'm going to go a few minutes over the time that we told you because I wasn't sure how long this would take and put together all this. And I, I'm up here in control of the microphone, and I'm doing it anyway. Uh, but as I, as I look back on this, you know, to me, it's an absolute miracle because you see bits and pieces at the time. God brings along this person and that person, these people, and sort of people who are totally are isolated from each other and certain events that occur and you see God brings all sorts of people to us in all sorts of ways just as God brought the animals to Noah he brings all these people into our lives and as I look back on the ministry of Answers in Genesis the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter and see all the people God brought into our lives and I now look at it and realize it's like a beautiful web that he's woven a beautiful designed web. And uh, so how does that legacy continue? You know what? God has raised up all sorts of leaders within the ministry. We're handing over more and more uh, to uh, some of the younger uh, people who are visionaries in themselves that God has brought along. Uh, but what about leadership uh, for the ministry? And a few years ago, our board members who are here tonight, actually, because we have a board meeting this week, and uh, so they're all here as well. And uh, they kept saying to me, what happens when the bus hits Ken Ham? And they started talking about the bus coming and hitting Ken Ham. I got that way. I wouldn't even cross a road if I saw a bus. I wouldn't hop on a bus. What happens when the bus uh, hits Ken Ham? Well, God brought into our lives uh, someone very special, Joe Boone. I'm going to ask Joe to come up uh, here. And I, I just want you to show you again, as part of that web, that beautiful web that God weaves, how he prepares the way and prepares things. And Joe's just going to give you a short testimony because recently I've been CEO and president since we started the ministry. And uh, recently we appointed Joe as president under me. And I must admit, every staff member that came to me said, that is the best person to do this. And supporters, like you people here in the room, so many have contacted me and said, you couldn't have made a better choice. It was the choice that God made. Uh, and uh, so, Joe, why don't you tell them? Because it really relates to something on my father's uh, grave. It's the date, 9th of June, 1995. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ken. It's, uh, it's exciting to be here tonight and, and share this with you. I, I've been here at the ministry for 12 years, but the connection actually goes back 23 years uh, to 1995. Um, at the time, we were living in Indiana. We had, uh, my wife and I had a three-year-old daughter and another one on the way. And our next door neighbors were this wonderful Christian homeschooling family. And they invited us to come to the Indiana Homeschool Convention. I uh, didn't know much about homeschooling. We were thinking about education. I didn't know if homeschooling was legal. So we were curious, but uh, no, we went with them, wonderful family, and went to that convention in Indianapolis. And it was there we heard a speaker by the name of Ken Ham. And it was one of those light bulb moments where all the skeptical questions that I had about the Bible uh, got answered. And it really tied together. And it was one of those moments where I, I really uh, had such an impact on me and my family. Um, after that, we got into a Bible-believing church. We had soaked up a lot of the answers in Genesis resources, began homeschooling our children, and really had no idea at the time, but that conference and the impact that it had on us was preparing us for some significant events because it'd be just a few months later, our second child, our son, was born, and that day, shortly after his birth in the hospital, uh, my wife had grandma seizures and was diagnosed with a brain tumor. It'd be a few months later that my father, who I was in business with, running a fire truck manufacturing company, was diagnosed with acute leukemia. In those circumstances, I, I think had I not been equipped with the biblical answers that this ministry is so good at providing, particularly to the answer of, of death and suffering, how could a loving God, how can we have a loving God with the death and suffering that we have in this world? And we know from the Bible, we get those answers. And as I explained, it was so clear to us. And, and the church family that surrounded us at the time, as we, we went on that journey through those incredible difficulties, 
uh, had such an impact to us. And um, sadly, it would be nine years later uh, that my wife would pass away from the complications of that tumor. Um, my father, miraculously, is still alive today and survived uh, from that battle uh, with cancer. Uh, and the, the thing that uh, was amazing as we got to know Answers in Genesis and got connected and we became good supporters of the ministries ourselves and went to their family conferences and got equipped. And I got to know a lot of people here at Answers in Genesis. And it was about a year before the Creation Museum opened, I'd kind of been putting myself in this position before my wife had passed away to bring another partner in to, to the fire truck business. Um, and kind of slowly work myself out of the business. I, in those final months before she passed away, I, I would work from home, do sales and development work, and homeschool the kids, and continue to do that for the, the year after she passed away. But it put me in a position to where when an opportunity came up at Answers in Genesis, I was asked to, to join as their director of advancement. Um, I was in the position to do that. Um, I don't think I would ever have been in that position at that time in my life to do that if not for those circumstances. And so I came on board with Answers in Genesis in 2006. And shortly after I, I came on board, uh, Ken and I were having a meal one day, and I asked him the question, do you remember that conference in Indianapolis? And he said, yes, I remember it very well. And he said, I almost canceled that conference. His father was gravely ill at the time, and he was considering going back to Australia to visit with his father before he passed away. But he had a conversation with his father, and his father said, I'm soon to be with the Lord. You've been called to do what you're doing. Don't cancel that conference. You don't know who you're going to reach. So that day in Indianapolis... An hour before he's to walk on the stage to give the first of those presentations, he gets a call from his brother in Australia that his father had just passed away. June 9th in 1995. And in that audience was me. Uh, forever impacted. Um, and it just shows us the legacy uh, that a family can have, that fathers and parents can have on children and grandchildren and the impact that it had. And it would be shortly after that as well that the Lord would bring to me uh, my wife, Jill. We met shortly after I came over here and got married in 2008. So we just celebrated our 10th anniversary as she adopted both my children at the time. And it's been such a great blessing having her along with me here in the ministry. But to see what the Lord has done through this ministry and the impact, I know when we get to heaven, we'll have the opportunity to see how the Lord has made that web, has all those connections that we'll see. And I had the chance to see one of those connections uh, here on earth in an incredible testimony. So Ken, thank you for you and all the work that you have done to make this ministry what it is. And thank you for being a part of this ministry. Thanks, Joe. And uh, you can see God, God raised up Joe for this time and to, to be in leadership in this ministry and uh, be president. So there you have it, the legacy of godly parents. And what more could I say? But thank you to the Lord for placing me in the care of two godly people and using them to pass on a legacy that is impacting millions of people with the truth of God's word and, and the gospel. And all I can say is praise the Lord for godly parents. And the question is, what legacy are we leaving in this world? But there's one more slide I want to share with you, because I mean this when I say it. If it wasn't for one particular person, this ministry wouldn't be where it is today at all. And that's this person here. She has supported me a million percent, never questioned, uh, and, and never seen the ministry as competing, all the travels I've done, looked after the children, and the children will tell you they've never heard her say a negative thing. 
and never question. I think that's, why, that's a big contributing factor as to why all our kids, they love the Lord, they're devoted uh, to our family, to their children. And uh, I tell you, if it wasn't for Mally, this ministry would not be where it is because for someone to put up with what she's put up with over the years and to support me, all the traveling, being away from home and all the attacks we receive and all the other sorts of things, and she in the background, very shy, reserved, but supporting me a million percent, this ministry would not be where it is without such a godly wife, which I praise the Lord for. And so there it is. Well, I do trust you enjoyed the presentation of Fire My Bones. And you also now know that the three special people that I was talking about, and of course there's lots of people that I do discuss during the presentation, but three special ones, my parents and my wife, Mally. When we were first considering coming to America to work with the Institute for Creation Research for a few years, it was a sort of a difficult time for us in struggling with are we sure we're making the right decision? We're gonna leave father and mother. We're gonna leave uh, our siblings. We're, we're, we're gonna leave our homeland and we're gonna drag our children over to a foreign country and actually be involved in a, a ministry in a land that, you know, is, is gonna be so different. And we were still uneasy about it all in one sense. We really believe God had called us to do it, but we were still struggling with I hope we're making the right decision. And crying out to the Lord, Lord, we're willing to do this, but can you just, just give us a piece about it? And I remember we went to a wedding and the pastor was actually the father of the groom. And he looked at his daughter-in-law-to-be and he said, you know, you need to be like Ruth. Where your husband goes, you go. Where he lodges, you lodge. His God, your God. And he gave a message from Ruth. And it was interesting, as Mally and I were sitting there in that church, Mally turned to me and she said, you know, I'm just like Ruth. Where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. Your God, my God. She said, I'm, I'm like Ruth. That's me. And that is Mally. Around that particular time, the church we were attending was actually moving out further into the suburbs. And so we had to transfer our membership to a nearby church. And there are a number of us that actually did that. And the pastor of that church had known my parents for many, many years. And when new people were actually accepted into membership, he would actually bring them out the front and get them to give a little testimony. And Mally talked to me and said, I'm not a public speaker and you know how shy I am. And I don't know what to say and what, what am I going to do? And, and then she looked at me and she said, what if I just say, my testimony is that I'm like Ruth. Where you go, I go. And I said, you know, that, that's really good. I think that'll be fantastic. Well, that particular Sunday when those who were becoming new members transferred from this other church uh, went forward as the pastor called us to the front, we were ready to give our little testimony but then the pastor did something totally different. He decided to give a testimony about each person. He hadn't spoken to us about this. We didn't know he was going to do that. When he came to Mally, he just looked at her and he said, Mally, I've watched you and I, I, I know you. And as I've thought about you, you remind me of Ruth. And remember what she said. Where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. Your God, my God. I see that sort of commitment in you. To us, that was, I don't know, we, we took it as just a confirmation that God was saying, I'm in this, I'm calling you to do this. And looking back on it, we can certainly see God's hand in all of that. And we just praise him and thank him for the way in which he's led us. When we came to America, our fifth child was born in America, in California, Christelle. And so we named her Christelle Ruth. Well, when I first met Buddy Davis in his log cabin, and I asked him to play a song on the guitar I saw sitting on the shelf, Buddy played and sang the song, He Makes Dreams Out of Nothing. 
And so I said to Buddy, when we open the Creation Museum, not if, but when, because I was sure that God had called us to build the Creation Museum. And I was really sure that Buddy and Kay and their dinosaurs were going to be a part of the Creation Museum. I said, I want you to play and sing, He Makes Dreams Out of Nothing. Now enjoy Buddy Davis as he sings, He Makes Dreams Out of Nothing, the song that was sung when we opened the Creation Museum, 2007. He makes dreams out of nothing And he makes the dreams come true He has given you a vision You must hold on to the view If you but ask you shall receive But in your heart you must believe He has a victory for you And he'll make sure your dreams come true You're a child of the King The creator of dreams And your faith is a key door and then you'll see he but speaks and it is done soon your battle will be won he has a victory for you and he'll make sure your dreams come true he makes dreams out of nothing And he makes the dreams come true Don't be discouraged by the past A door will open if you ask And don't give up, keep on praying He's never given up on you He makes dreams out of nothing And he makes the dreams come true You're a child of the King The creator of dreams And your faith is a key Unlock the door and then you speaks and it is done soon your battle will be won he has a victory for you and he'll make sure your dreams come true Wow. <clears throat> the, I, the first time I heard that song in Buddy's Cabin, I thought, yeah, it's pretty cool. But the last time I heard it, when the, we opened the museum, cut the ribbon, it was really an emotional experience. And ever since that time, it, I, you know, we, fu- we thought, well, the battle's won. We opened the Creation Museum. Then Ken came up with a wild idea of opening an ark. And we started the battle all over again. But every time I hear that song now, I get a little bit emotional because it was such a blessing and we, we got through such an amazing challenge. <clears throat> and uh, we just keep uh, opening new doors and we keep knocking on doors and pushing them open a little bit and God either closes them on us or lets us push through and we're continually blessed. And we serve an amazing amazing God. And when you walk through the museum, Patrick and I've talked about this a number of times just in the last few weeks, walking around the museum and look at all the things God's done 
walking through the ark, and then the, when you saw it, the, when we first opened it, we were talking about this in the video that we saw, it was pretty plain looking. There was hardly any grass, nothing there. Two years later, the place looks spectacular, and God just continues to bless us with just the right people every time we turn around. Some of these people have been in the ministry. We didn't even know they had the talents they had, and we have a need. Somebody stepped up, and they're perfectly suited for and trained for what we needed to do. So it's been a tremendous blessing and, and a, just a, an amazing time, this, this fast, fast, fast 25 years that we've spent. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you humbly and, and thank you for just the way you've had your hand on Ken, had your hand on everyone that's been a part of this ministry, Lord, the way you've blessed and the way you've honored the, uh, our uh, honoring your word and the authority of your word. And we just ask that you'd continue to, to open doors for us, God, go before us. And Lord, may we do everything to honor you and lift up Jesus Christ in everything we do, everything we publish, every exhibit that we open, uh, all that we do, Lord, that we would, we would lift up uh, your Son, our Savior. We thank you, Lord, for the staff that you brought to the ministry and the incredible, amazing, talented, uh, gifted, and dedicated people that you, know, you bring here that have done so, so many amazing things. And we ask that you continue to bless our staff and our families, that they would uh, see the fruits of, of their efforts through the souls that are saved. And uh, the people that we meet in heaven, Lord, that came to know you through some of the efforts that uh, we were able to use to present your word. We give you the praise for all that you've done for us. In Christ's name, amen.